Um, I want to wish everyone that's joined us good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are to all. And we thank you for joining the Sex Work Health and Human Rights book launch. This is a little bit of a sneak peek, given that in a few days delay in the publisher uploading the final open source book. But it will be there, and we have a link to share with you later. So, I'm Ruth Morgan Thomas. I'm Global Coordinator of NSWP. It's a global network of 314 sex worker led organizations across 96 countries, with more than 70% of those countries being lower and middle income countries. So we are truly global and represent sex workers in the global south as well as in the global north. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by the co-authors, Dr. Shira Goldenberg, Dr. Stefan Barrell, and Anna Forbes. Today's event is scheduled for one hour long, and it will include an overview from the editors, as well as video compilations from three of our academic and community author teams. We'll then end the event with a brief Q&A. So please use the chat function to enter questions throughout the event. And with this, I am going to hand you over to um, Shira. Over to you, Shira. Thanks so much, Ruth. Uh, so, so just wanted to start out as well with the land acknowledgement um, on behalf of the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity, which is situated on the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And we would also like to acknowledge that you are joining us today from many places near and far. And we acknowledge and express our gratitude towards the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So I wanted to begin just with a little bit of an overview of the book and some of the contributions that it makes. Uh, this volume really highlights the sustained health and social inequities that sex workers in all their diversity experience today. Uh, the book is guided by a balanced community academic partnership, and it really aims to ensure that sex workers' voices are amplified in describing both challenges and the ways forward. And collectively, the chapters that we'll share with you today and that you can read more about in the book describe an elevated burden, for example, of um, health inequities, including HIV, STIs, uh, other sexual and reproductive health needs, uh, violence, and substance use. Uh, we also use community case studies and data in each chapter to really demonstrate that sex workers are not passive recipients of these structural inequities, but are in fact actively resisting and mobilizing to advocate for improved health, safety, and human rights conditions and policy changes. So I'm going to go section by section just to provide a broad overview of some of the contributions of all the amazing teams who've contributed to this work and some of the key findings of each chapter. Um, so in the first section of the book, we discussed the burden of health and human rights inequities faced by sex workers around the world. In our first chapter here, Nikita Viswasam, Justice Rivera and colleagues used epidemiological research and the lived experience of sex workers to describe the global HIV burden and gaps in access to HIV prevention, treatment, care and support. This chapter highlights current gaps in data, including limited research with communities of cis men and transgender sex workers as well as the need for further data that's focused on the harms of criminalization and intersectional risks. Uh, in the next chapter by Elena Argento, Katie Wynn from the Asia Pacific Network of Sex, Work, sex Workers, as well as colleagues show the disproportionate burden of violence and human rights violations that sex workers face using a review of global literature complemented by case studies from the Asia Pacific Network of Sex Workers. And this chapter really highlights the deeply negative impacts of rights violations linked to criminalization of sex work punitive law enforcement, and the lack of labor protections that sex workers continue to face. In the next chapter, Duff and Shapiro describe current gaps in access to sexual and reproductive health services experienced by men, women, and trans sex workers globally, drawing on both academic literature and in-depth interviews and focus groups with 171 sex workers and sex worker organizations undertaken by NSWP across 10 countries. In a chapter by Carmen Logi, Patrick Lalore and colleagues um, partnered with the Sex Work Association of Jamaica, um, they address sex workers' mental health in relation to social cohesion among sex workers. Um, using research in Jamaica, the findings show that sex workers um, uh, who experience greater social cohesion also face reduced odds of depressive symptoms and violence. Um, and the Sex Work Association of Jamaica developed a really important in-depth narrative of the lived experiences of social cohesion among sex workers in this context. 
Last but not least, a chapter by Jenny Iverson, Pike Long and colleagues evaluated the health needs of sex workers who use drugs using a systematic review and case studies from the St. James Infirmary in San Francisco. Uh, this review included 86 studies conducted in 46 countries and showed uh, the particular need for more research involving men and trans sex workers on these issues. Uh, the next section shows how these issues are deeply shaped by structural factors. And here we'd like to share an example of one of the collaborations that you'll see featured in the next section, focused on stigma, denial of health services and other human rights violations faced by sex workers in Africa. Uh, so please uh, enjoy this video. Hi, I'm Alice Richter, and I'm a co-author of a chapter on stigma and healthcare in Africa. Hi, my name is Kolibu Telezi. I was also part of the co-author on the um, a book launch uh, on sex work and, and, and human rights book launch. Yes. Koli, for you and me to, to have collaborated on this chapter, uh, is there anything that you learned specifically about the collaboration that you think would be useful to share? I think my experience um, in this cohort was very important because it has also contributed to um, my skills mm -hmm. in writing and also it contributed um, into my knowledge. So it did actually contribute into my own capacity to be able to know in the near future when um, I'm part of the cohort and especially when you're writing up uh, something that will be published. So I've, I've gained a lot of experience because we had a back and forth uh, to send it back and then they send it for comment and then we had to rewrite. So that was an experience. Then also I think to work with someone like you who is an expert uh, uh, in writing. Um, I've, I've learned a lot of things, I must say. Yeah, Koli, it was, it was such a pleasure to collaborate with you. I mean, you and I have been for years, <laughs> right? Um, and this is the first yeah. time that you and I have formally uh, co-authored a chapter together um, and what I found really yes. useful is your your voice notes like the the way we we communicated where you would give me um, would give me input and I, I would write some of it up um, and or to shape the the thinking around around healthcare and especially your own experiences with healthcare that I think shaped uh, shaped the chapter and provided some of the key recommendations. Yeah. So that um, that I found really useful. Um, we, we made a number of recommendations um, in our conclusion in the chapter. So we, we spoke uh, about some of the research in Africa, what it shows around sex workers' experiences of healthcare and how there's stigma and so on, um, and how that creates barriers to, to mm. healthcare services. What do you think is the most important recommendation that we made um, in terms of sex worker access to healthcare services that you think would be useful to share? I think the important recommendations that we have made was that um, the, 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 the sensitivity of uh, the community healthcare workers, um, mm -hmm. if they have that kind of uh, treatment towards uh, sex workers, then the environment uh, in that space in terms of accessing healthy facilities, um, it then becomes very much hostile and that then um, drives sex workers into mm -hmm. um, darker places and also not to, to wish to access the services even if they've got any challenges that they have faced, especially within the sex industry, uh, especially so, uh, currently in South Africa, sex work is criminalized. Um, sex workers mostly are at high risk of being raped. So therefore in that way, when they go to health facilities, there's a lot of questions that they've been asked. Um, you need a, 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 to bring a, a partner because sometimes sex workers they tend to lie and say the condom break, which it didn't happen, but because of they fear to tell uh, the profession and kind of uh, work that they do that, okay, I was raped and stuff like that, that then makes them not to be openly um, speak about the exactly issue that um, had happened or the matter that had happened, which within our, our, our Sisonge um, movement as an organization, as a leading human rights organization in South Africa that is advocating for the rights of sex workers due to, I mean, during the uh, awareness educational that we do in our spaces on a monthly basis, we always advise sex workers to tell the truth of what happened so that they can be given 
uh, the medication that is actually relevant to the uh, uh, matter or the issue that has actually made that person to access health facilities. So then if the environment is hostile, that then um, leads the sex workers not to wanting to access those services. The recommendation that I think we made in the chapter was that um, the free stigma and discrimination environment in accessing those healthy facilities, it is important because therefore sex workers, they go by themselves without actually being pushed or accommodated by anyone. Well, yeah, I think you, you're very right. And I think we, we learned these lessons in a, in a particularly poignant way during COVID because we wrote the chapter before the pandemic really started in South Africa. And many of the things that you're talking now makes me think of, of how, the increased urgency and relevance um, of that relationship building and the trust. And I think one of the points that we make yes. in our chapter is when sex workers and, and other marginalized groups, when they have a positive experience at a healthcare facility, it is such a powerful, uh, a, a mm. powerful experience that it has a knock on effect in terms of uh, their willingness to go back uh, for their True. Yeah, to, for them to look after their health um, and in, in instances to, to create partnerships and uh, coalition building with, with sex worker groups. And I think that's something that uh, I really appreciated um, in the way that we unpacked it in the, the chapters, not just, not just the, the bad experiences and the, the hard, uh, the very hard research uh, that we quoted, but also in the instances where there's been really uh, positive and constructive experiences with healthcare workers, how great that was. Um, and I think uh, yes. we concluded our chapter with a very strong call for the decriminalization of sex work and how important it is for the political will um, of our government in, in South Africa and elsewhere to, to remove the criminal law from, uh, from sex work. Um, and how that would would be a, a immensely powerful um, component in in sex worker health and well being. Um, so I really yes, and definitely because yeah, I think it, definitely because um, the criminal uh, system actually it is a big barrier uh, in everything that the sex workers are trying to do. Whether they're trying to access um, uh, legal facilities, you know, the stigma that comes with it. I'm talking about the case that was reported to me yesterday. A sex mm -hmm. worker was beaten up by police. Um, the uh, arm was broken. And when the peers accommodated to accompany to go and lay a charge, they were told that the police station that they cannot lay a charge against a police officer, which then those are some of the, the, mm -hmm. the, the, the barriers that then deny the sex workers to access healthy facilities um, and they also the legal facilities because of the criminal law system. Yeah. Thank you, Polly. Yes. It was really nice to talk to you. Thank you so much. All right, we're going to move on to the next section, and that's a really perfect segue into the next section of the book, which addresses the structural determinants of health and human rights inequities that sex workers face. Um, so in the first chapter in this section by Andrea Crusi, Kate Dadano, and Ariel Cernick, uh, the team synthesizes research evidence and sex work community case studies from the global north and south to show how cis and trans sex workers' occupational health, safety, and human rights are violated and undermined under various models of criminalization, including as we just heard in South Africa. Uh, these models include full criminalization as well as end demand models that criminalize clients and third parties, but not sex workers directly. And the powerful evidence provided in this chapter really illustrates how the criminalization and policing of sex work directly shapes sex workers' health and safety. Um, as we just heard in the chapter by uh, Marlies Richter and Koli Boutelezi, uh, this collaboration describes experiences of stigma, denial of care, and other human rights violations faced by sex workers uh, in health service delivery settings in Africa. And this was a collaboration with the Sisonke uh, sex worker uh, organization. Uh, this chapter really shows how sex workers' negative experiences with health services um, that are shaped, as we heard, by criminalization and policing really act as a severe barrier to sex workers realizing their full right to health and quality health care as they deserve. And finally, last but not least, work by Bronwyn McBride and Trice Januszew of the Red Edition um, in Eastern Europe focuses on the health and social needs of women, men, and gender diverse immigrant sex workers around the world. Uh, a synthesis of research as well as community consultations in Europe showcase the unique concerns of immigrant sex workers in destination countries. 
based on their intersecting identities, not only as sex workers, but also as immigrants. And these concerns include racialized police harassment and surveillance, mandatory health testing, economic marginalization, discrimination, as well as language barriers. We'd now like to move, like to, move to another video, um, which showcases how in the final section of the book, we discuss and really focus on interventions to improve sex workers' health and human rights. And this is a great collaboration um, that focused on occupational health, safety, and rights in indoor workplaces. So we hope you enjoy learning more about this work by um, Empower and Brooke West. Welcome everyone to Empower University. Uh, we're happy to come and talk with all friends, old and new, and the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity from University of British Columbia. Empower is part of and central to the sex worker community in Thailand. We use our drop-in center or our space as a place of learning to celebrate, cry, play, eat, and organize together, including doing our own community research. We know that every sex worker, whether she's uh, brand new to Empower or been around for a while, has something to bring to the table in terms of our community research. So it's a process of people bringing what they have from their experience and knowledge. And then we carve it up and cut it up and add this and add that until we have something that we can present to other people. So working with Brooke and other academics is a little bit different, but our process of what we do within Empower remains the same. We come together, we do it together, and in the end, everybody is happy with the result. Over the years, we've made a lot of documentation uh, from our thoughts and we're really hoping that universities will use what we've said in our books as well. In this project, as in other projects, we were again ran into the problem where sex workers who are the main experts and the main contributors to the PhD or research or journal article have to have their identity disguised. They have to be hidden and it just feels very unfair that they never are able to be visible and get the credit that they deserve for the work. So we're really grateful to the British Columbia and NSWP and Brooke especially, bringing us over this large problem that we run into every time. And these are the three things that we wanted to give you as our take home messages from our chapter. Thanks again to everyone and a big cheer and we'll see you at Kendu Bar when you can come. Bye. I'm Brooke West. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Social Work at Columbia University. And I had the privilege of working with Empower Tideland and uh, Liz Hilton uh, on the book chapter on indoor sex work venues. So what did I take from the experience? Um, in addition to just learning a great deal from working with Empower and being continually impressed by the work that they are doing, I think the major take home that I have is an anecdote that Liz shared with me when we were first discussing the chapter. So we were talking about interventions in relation to indoor venues. And Liz said that when she was talking to uh, members of Empower, they had a good laugh because the translation of intervention in Thai is meddling. And that's such an important take home message because uh, I, I think that as academics, we are often thinking about interventions and although we may be well-intentioned, what we are actually doing is meddling in people's lives. And there's a lot of um, unforeseen or negative consequences of that, even in the best of circumstances. Um, so when I think about recommendations or take-homes, it's just uh, 
to keep that in mind that uh, we need to be thinking about how to support dignity and how to promote rights and how to further justice. Um, and to do so, we need to be working in conjunction with communities. We need to be lifting up the voices of communities. Um, and that has uh, been something that's been so lovely about working um, on this book chapter and working with empowerment, uh, with Empower. Um, yeah, thank you. Great, okay, well, this takes us into the final section of our book before we um, hear from some others on this call today. Um, so the last section of the book focuses on evidence-based services and best practices, and really how we can move forward with this work to create action, to promote rights, and to promote equity. So as we just heard, the work by Brooke West, Liz Hilton, um, and Empower, um, as well as colleagues, really addresses sex workers' rights, occupational safety, and health in indoor workplaces. The chapter discusses how indoor venues pose important potential for establishing and implemented occupational health and safety standards in sex work. And I think this is so important, and actually today we have chosen to host this event on the International Day for Safety at Work to really highlight sex work as an occupational health and rights issue. Uh, the chapter also talks about the opportunity for collective organizing that comes from sex workers working within uh, indoor workspaces, and I think that's really important. Uh, in the next chapter, Cynthia Navarrete Gill, Manjula Ramaya, Claire Barrington, and Deanna Kerrigan reviewed literature on community empowerment and mobilization as a means to address HIV, violence, and other health and human rights issues among sex workers. Case studies by sex worker led organizations Aproase in Mexico and Ashodayo Samati in India illustrate community empowerment processes and challenges, including barriers to scaling up services. And the chapter really speaks as well to the evidence gaps that continue to persist in this field, including more limited evaluation of such programs among men and trans sex workers. Um, so again, just a really important contribution given everything we know about the importance of community organizing and sex work uh, for health outcomes and human rights. In the next chapter, Sheree Schwartz, Felister Abdallah from the Kenya Sex Workers Alliance and colleagues review scientific evidence on existing approaches to designing and evaluating integrated interventions and interventions that take place at multiple levels uh, to improve sex workers' health. And this is complemented by sex work community perspectives uh, provided from the Kenya Sex Workers Alliance. And the chapter really describes the dominance of biomedical and behavioral um, intervention models and the need for further incorporation and evaluation of structural intervention and components. And then last but not least, as we'll hear in a moment, work by Gillian Abel and Catherine Healy um, from the New Zealand Sex Workers Collective really demonstrates how New Zealand's national decriminalization of sex work promotes best practices for occupational health, safety, and social inclusion of sex workers. Um, some of the outcomes that they've seen in response to this uh, amazing uh, policy change has been improved in access to justice, police responsiveness to violence, and interagency collaboration to support safer occupational environments. So this is really a best practice model uh, for other countries uh, seeking to move in this direction. And gaps uh, nonetheless do remain in New Zealand, including for migrant sex workers who are not protected under the law. So that's an area um, that's really identified of needing more attention in the work. So we'll go ahead now so you can hear directly uh, from Jillian and Catherine uh, about their collaboration. Hi, I'm Jillian. I've been doing research with Catherine and NZPC since 1997. We've always worked collaboratively, whether this is in identifying what research needs to be done, what questions we need to address and how we collect the data. We've also worked collaboratively in the write-up process and have jointly edited a book called Taking the Crime Out of Sex Work. So collaborating together in writing the chapter for sex work, health and human rights wasn't entirely new for us. 
something I really enjoy because I think it's important that the voice of the sex worker community leads to the discussion on what policies, interventions or services aimed at them need to look like. Congratulations on bringing this book to publication. Um, I want to reflect on our relationship, our organisation NZPC Aotearoa New Zealand Sex Workers Collective has had a very long relationship in working with Professor Gillian Abel. You know, understandably, we've learnt a lot over the 20 plus years that we've worked with her. And, you know, working on this chapter, I thought some of the principles um, are clear, really. Gillian's always had the way of, you know, deference, really, to our thinking. She stands back and she doesn't um, arrive necessarily with an idea that she wants to pursue. She has always been really respectful and understood that we want to bring the ideas to the table. We want to say, look, we think this is relevant to our lives. You know, this is the kind of research that could complement um, what we need to know about what's happening in, you know, the lives of sex workers. Um, we've also been able to say, look, we think actually um, the, these are the kinds of scenarios that that could inform people better. Before the, we um, wrote this chapter, we held a meeting which took most of the day. It was at NZPC offices in Wellington. There were about three or four other members of NZPC in the room with Catherine and I. And we discussed what we thought was most important to include in a chapter on sex worker-led services in New Zealand's decriminalised context. And we chose to look at three initiatives. The first was a collaboration between NZPC and police to produce a resource which would make it easier for sex workers to report sexual violence to police. The second was a collaboration between the NZPC and, the, and medical officers of health to improve practices within brothels. And the third was the facilitation of information to new sex workers to help them to take control of their working environment. So when we worked together on this chapter, we had the task of um, identifying case studies and we spoke with Gillian about this. One of the case studies involved our relationship with the police and how that had improved over time with decriminalisation, the effects of decriminalisation. And Gillian was able to complement that and say, well, you know, I know in terms of international literature and, you know, bring in, you know, the academic kind of stuff to support what it was that we were experiencing. The key point we make in our chapter is that none of these initiatives would have been possible had sex work not been decriminalised in New Zealand. Sex workers' voices are being heard. NZPC are able to engage with a variety of stakeholders and take the lead in all initiatives aimed at improving sex workers' health, safety and well-being. I think um, in terms of thinking about language too, I think it's, it's interesting, you know, when you're an insider, you have the lived experience, so you know exactly um, what a particular phrase or word um, means in that context and sometimes you know academics will get it wrong and sometimes we will get it wrong and so you have to negotiate and navigate those um, the, you know the, the, those uh, relationships as well without um, digging in if you like so I you know we've always come back to Gillian time and again because we found her very receptive to um, our lived experience in documenting things that we feel are relevant. Of course she maintains her independence, I mean she's not going to uh, compromise her integrity either and you know that that's also very important. I think the key thing that was reinforced for me in the writing of this chapter is the importance of collaboration. The sex worker community need to decide what they think are the important important issues that need research rather than an outsider researcher coming in and telling them what their problems are. Research is far more relevant when driven by the understandings of the community. As a non-peer researcher, I don't have that insider knowledge and the only way to increase my understanding and produce publications 
um, that are relevant and have the potential to make a difference is to take my lead from NZPC. It doesn't mean that I have no say. Catherine's always respectful of my viewpoint. Our long-standing relationship allows us the ability to negotiate and work through any issues that may arise until we reach a mutually agreed position. Um, we're excited to see this uh, publication come to fr fruition and um, thank you for inviting us to this event, albeit virtually. Thank you. I feel enormously privileged to have spent the last 24 years of my life undertaking research in the field of sex work with my wonderful partners. I believe though that we're more than just research partners. What we have forged over the last 24 years has been a lasting and very real friendship. Well, on that note, I'm gonna uh, now pass things over to Ruth and just wanted to first say just what a privilege it's been for me um, as an editor to have the opportunity to work with such amazing teams of, um, of co-authors on each of these chapters. As you can hear, those collaborations have been incredibly rich and it's been an amazing learning uh, opportunity and privilege for me. So I'll pass things over to you now, Ruth. Thanks, Shira. And I've been given the task of um, outlining the key recommendations that come when you read all 12 chapters. There are very clear similarities and recommendations across a number of chapters. And it's providing us with the scientific and community evidence of the changes that we need to see. So I'm just going to read out these for you to emphasize them. So decriminalizing all aspects of sex work including sex workers, our clients, third parties, our families, partners and friends. You can't just pick the bits of sex work that you want to decriminalise if you want the benefits that New Zealand is seeking. The second recommendation is that you actually recognise sex workers' work, not just allowing it to be considered informal labour without labour rights, but actually considering it to be formal labour with full labour rights and right to social protection. In other the third one is about ensuring that healthcare services are accessible, non-coercive, responsive to the diversity of sex workers' needs, and that they determine the needs, not the medics. The fourth recommendation touches on what Coley was talking about in terms of um, policing. And it is absolutely essential that we end policing, immigration, and other state-sanctioned crackdowns surveillance and harassment of sex workers, clients and third parties. That increases vulnerability and there is evidence, clear evidence that says that that is the case. The fifth recommendation is about building trust and partnership between health systems and sex worker led organizations. We have a huge amount to be gained from building trusting partnerships and collaboration between healthcare providers and the community that they are meant to serve. The sixth one is about prioritizing community empowerment and community mobilization across research, programming, and policy. Too often we see biomedical interventions only that leave aside the structural barriers that actually impact on our vulnerability to poor health outcomes, but also to poor social outcomes as well. The seventh recommendation is about supporting collaboration between sex worker led organizations and academics, policymakers, and programmers who are committed to addressing the inequities across health, human rights, and justice. And that's an enormous piece of work, but actually, collaboration is the key to success in this. We as sex workers can't do it on our own, nor can academics, nor can policymakers or providers. We have to work together and together we're stronger. So the eighth recommendation is about ensuring access to health and social services and support for sex workers, regardless of mobility or immigration status. And I would probably add to that access to justice as well and legal services. Absolutely critical that we have our needs met and are not kept away from the services that other citizens are receiving. The second last um, recommendation is about supporting sustainable and resilient sex worker led and evidence based approaches. 
It's about not thinking in the short term. The problems that we face across the sex worker community need long term sustainable responses. We can't resolve criminalization and the issues it presents with short term approaches and short term funding. And that moves us on to providing those resources to strengthen the capacity among sex workers and sex worker led organizations to become meaningfully involved in design, implementation and evaluation of research and policy and programs. As you heard a number of people say in the videos, we are the experts in our own lives if you'll only listen to us. And so this book is demanding that you hear us alongside the academics. We have produced um, infographics with recommendations for different stakeholders. And you can see the graphics of those here and they are available from the website. So the recommendations have said, provide further evidence to support our advocacy for a rights affirming approach to sex work that recognizes and respects sex workers agency and bodily autonomy, as well as honoring the rights that we have. These are not rights that we're asking to be given, they're rights that we have in international human rights treaties. They are ours, you can't give them to us, we own them. We just need society and the rest of the world to respect and protect them and governments to fulfill them. So for NSWP and our members who joined the author teams writing these chapters, um, across a three year project for us, I know for the academics, they were at it a year longer than us because we've talked about that. But this experience has been a real learning experience, which actually has enabled the sex worker communities to grow both our knowledge and our confidence in engaging and collaborating with academics. It has demonstrated that respectful and meaningful collaboration between sex workers and academics is possible. And I say that with a history in academia, I left academia ooh, 20, well, maybe nearly 30 years ago, um, because I didn't feel that I was respected or honored as a sex worker who was out and being an academic in the University of Edinburgh. And certainly my experience of academics at that time is they saw us only as subjects and not as partners. And it is really wonderful to see us move forward to a time when we have this sort of collaboration between academic institutions and my community around the world. And with that, I am going to hand it back to Shira to introduce Sebastian. Great. Well, we're delighted to have Sebastian here today from the Open Society Foundation, um, who's going to talk with us a little bit about the, uh, his involvement and the involvement of the Open Society Foundations in this work, as well as in the broader field of sex worker rights. Uh, so please take it away, Sebastian. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Shira, and hello, everyone. Um, so as Shira said, my name is Sebastian Kuhn. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm with the Open Society Foundations, uh, which was one of, the, one of the financial supporters of this book project. And first, I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be here for this launch. I, I think this book is so important. I think it fills so many gaps in our in our collective understanding of what sex worker need and want to protect their health and human rights. Um, many of you may know the Open Society Foundations as a donor that funds organizations and projects to advance things like democratic practice or, or social justice. Um, but what's, what's even more fundamental uh, to Open Society is, is knowledge production. Like how do we produce knowledge or an understanding of what we need to do in order to build a better world? And how do we do that on issues that remain politically or socially or culturally contentious? My view is, is that we must center and work with communities uh, in shaping the knowledge that informs uh, policies and practices that impact those communities. So in other words, and you know, as, as others have, have pointed to, sex workers are the experts on their own lives. And for many years, this has, this has informed our approach to supporting sex worker health and rights. We have um, overwhelmingly focused our grant making uh, on sex worker led organizations around the world. 
and to the extent that we've supported research efforts, our ambition has been to, to ensure that sex workers have been central in determining how the research is done and ultimately able to use the research in their own, in their advocacy. And to me, this book, this book is really a, an excellent example of, and you know, others have said this too, but of a deep collaboration between sex worker activists and academics. And I think the result is, is, is just striking. I, I hope it becomes a, a reference to all of us, um, an, an affirmation, not just of sex worker agency, uh, but also of principles and values for research, for policy and for programs. I want to I want to just end my my brief remarks by stating the perhaps uh, obvious um, you know more than a, a year into a pandemic that's been devastating to sex workers around the world there's no question to me that health is essential to both human rights and to open societies this makes this this book I think makes that abundantly clear and through the conclusions and recommendations that that Ruth just just uh, uh, went through it really provides a guide to action for, for all of us. Um, I wanna extend huge thanks to everyone who's made this happen, um, from the excellent authors, to the editors, to all of you who've played a role uh, in the background. Um, thank you and, and, and congratulations. And with that, I will hand over to Steph Barral. Hi. <clears throat> Hi everybody. Yeah, I, I just wanted to just just to say two words, uh, building on on what Shira said. As an academic, <clears throat> being part of this work has been really critical, and and has been exactly the type of collaboration that I think we wanted ac across. Um, and I think historically, and it, it took time to do that. And it and I think it's also important to say that it takes resources to do that but that the resources not just go to academic groups, but that the resources really ensure because often that is the case. And I think that we need to move forward to, to a model um, where we ensure that, that the community partners are funded in exactly the same way and have the opportunity to engage in a very balanced way um, with research uh, in as much as, as the sort of learning phases and the summative phases of this work. My job here today is just to uh, moderate the Q&A um, and so I am going to, there, there has been really great, um, uh, there's been really great discussions um, that have happened within the chat box, but I think it'd be great to sort of bring some of those out uh, into the Q&A and we, we have about uh, 10 minutes to do that. Um, and I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with a question that was put forward um, with really around sustainability. Uh, and I think there's, there's been obviously a, a common theme throughout all of these chapters was about the importance of decriminalization, the fundamental importance in terms of, of just achieving human rights, of, of improving health outcomes. Um, and so, you know, the, the question was posed, there's a recurring theme in, in most of the decriminalization discussions about the disconnect between the policy and the legislative frameworks. Um, and, and maybe we could have folks uh, speak to how sustainable are global mechanisms and practices that are intended to influence and improve sex workers' health if there's this hostile environment in which they're taking place. Um, and it would be great uh, to, to, to sort of build on that. And there was some focus on where the Global Fund programs uh, are exiting and have done that based on the transition, um, what happens to the sex worker programs. Um, so it'd be great if, if it, it's complex, and I think we could probably talk a long time about that, but if, if somebody wanted to speak to that quickly. I suppose I'm, I'm happy to take a, a first shot at it um, right. in terms of the conflicts between um, the global mechanisms and the goals they set. And we have a prime example just now where um, the new global AIDS strategy from UNAIDS has set an incredibly aspirational goal, um, which I think we're going to find really difficult to make real. And I say that in their consultations as well. So less than 10% of countries will have punitive laws criminalizing sex work. We currently only have two countries, Australia in two states has full decriminalization now and New Zealand. And just as a for those that aren't aware, it took eight to nine years to get 
the decriminalization through the New Zealand legal process and legislative process. And yet in five years, we're meant to have done that in 90% of countries. So I think there is such a disconnect that it's hard to imagine how you bridge it, to be honest. I think um, from our community perspective, and Ruben, thank you for asking this question. I think we have shown perseverance. We have shown resilience as a community. And I think I'm saying the same things 30, 40 years later. I am very old in this movement, but we won't stop saying them. And I think the thing that encourages me is that more and more people are joining the sex worker rights call for the full decriminalization of sex work and recognizing our labor as work. I do think part of the um, struggle though, as you talked about, you talked about global fund and transitioning. Short-term funding will never allow us to achieve what are long-term actions. And we need ongoing core funding for sex worker-led organizations to truly engage and partner with academics, but also to influence policy, to influence the programs. And so my, my response is we need to keep on advocating for long-term and core funding for community at an equal level, actually, to other community system stuff that gets funded. Sorry, that was a very long answer. Um, no, I, I think that was really helpful. And I think, um, does anybody else, <clears throat> would anybody else like to add to it? Or I have one more question that I would like to have uh, directed towards Merrilee, which is a question, if, if anybody else, does anybody else want to add to that? Maybe I will, maybe, maybe I'll just say a few words just from the academic side, which is to say that all of the programs that I've seen um, be implemented, I'd say probably the major barrier to them are structural uh, limitations. Um, so it is um, often we, uh, focus a lot on education and these process outcomes. I will note just in, in when you evaluate it, the legal frameworks end up being such important predictors of outcomes that I think ignoring them um, really does a disservice to the programs as a whole. Um, and so trying, you know, trying to pretend that it's, you know, you're just focused on providing a particular service in, in the absence of the context in which it's taking place um, puts you in a position where there there is probably limited sustainability unless you change these fundamental underlying structural elements or at least work to, to change them as um, I'm going to move on to just this last question then to to Marilise and I'm going to direct it it was to both Coley and Marilise but um, it would be great to just hear um, you know a little bit more about how this process of this balanced partnership and really writing together and and, and how that has improved the collaboration that you spoke about historically um, now that you've read in this chapter together. So it'd be, it'd be great to hear your thoughts, Marilise, about that. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's currently seven o'clock in Cape Town in South Africa. So uh, I have my daughter here who's listening to cartoons. So I have to shout above her. Um, it's a real pleasure to, to be able to be at this launch um, and being able to put names to faces, people whose work I have read for many decades and to see them for the first time on a, on a screen has been a, a great pleasure. Um, I think Ruben's question about collaboration um, is an important one. For the chapter that Kuli and I worked on, it's, it's quite difficult to answer because it, it was just one component of the many projects that Kuli and I work on together. So it was, I think, in many ways, an opportunity to stand back a little bit and use an academic lens to make sense of the the advocacy and policy work that we've been involved in for, for many years and to write it up in a specific way. Um, and I think we both got a lot of uh, a lot of insight and pleasure from that. And I think what I hear from many of the authors or co-authors here this evening is that that's a relationship that wasn't necessarily built just in the, the writing of a chapter, that many many things had preceded the, the actual writing of the chapter and that there is a, a collaboration and a synergy across different worlds where sometimes the, the worlds are quite separate, uh, conference podiums or, 
or doing work in uh, in a nightclub, and how much of that is is merged when when we work around research and advocacy and activism. And it struck me from all the inputs here tonight, and also from the chapters that that everyone would whether they would say it or not, but have an activist hat on and their approach to, to the subject matter and how they view sex work um, within, within our current society. So it's a long answer to say to Ruben that it, it's hard uh, to answer your question from, from our perspective. I know an uh, uh, ac academic institution, the African Centre for Migration and Society at Wits University in Johannesburg, has very specific programs where there is strong collaboration between researchers and sex workers that span academic work, but also very popular work and how it teaches researchers to make their work more accessible and work with sex workers sorry, and work with sex workers uh, to include voices and platforms um, that academics have access to. So I think there are a number of models uh, that we can look at. Thank you. Great, Marilisa, that was that was really helpful. I'm going to move us to the next slide. Um, Megan, can you move us on to the acknowledgement? So, um, I think actually building on uh, Marilisa's answer, we you know as editors, um, we appreciate the just intense amount of work uh, that the authors and, and really sex worker led organizations and the academics. Did together. The, some of these were existing collaborations, some of these were new collaborations, but it was an extraordinary amount of work um, to do this and to now present truly this, this first textbook that exists that has been developed in, in I think, this very organic way. Um, and so from this, this, I also I think it's really important to thank the staff really from the Center for Gender and Sexual Health Equity who are represented here today and uh, Megan Bobetsis, who has been at the heart of this work uh, for several years, uh, Kate Milbury and Reka Kumru have really been critical to ensuring that we are here and, and communicating it as, as clearly as we can and, and really ensuring that there's a platform to continue sharing the work. And then there's really been on the NSWP side, just such an, you know, just such leadership throughout this process. And, and you know, funding uh, for the, you know, uh, for the work was provided by the Open Society Foundation, as well as SFU's or Simon Fraser and Access Fund to ensure that this is a resource that is broadly available uh, for everybody moving forward. And as we'll soon talk about is downloadable and will continue to be, it will exist as a physical textbook for purchase. And we hope it'll be used and we'll work for that to be used in academic centers and, and for communities and governments and others. Uh, but it also will be something that will be always uh, available as an open access product uh, for anybody who's interested in it. So with that, I'm going to hand uh, back over to Shira. Well, thanks so much, Steph. Um, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. This has been really fun. And, and as you've heard, this has been the culmination of a long term uh, effort and just so grateful to everybody who contributed to this project and for those who've attended today and um, who've expressed interest in this work. Um, 